So to apply for the UK Diplomatic Service, you apply to the UK Civil Service. So it's an open exam and then you, in it, you put your preferences for which government department you want to be in. And after the, if you pass the exams, after the interview process, you are told which government department you got into. We don't have a set percentage I think in the just under 20 years I've worked for the Foreign Service, the percentage would be about 99 point something career diplomats and then political, which basically means I think there's been one political ambassador at a time, at any time that I can recall. Well, I think the benefits of having a professional diplomatic service are the same as the benefits of having a professional civil service. So first of all, people are, are appointed on the basis of merit on the basis of clear criteria, that it's a transparent appointment process, so people can have faith in the fact that they're, the people who have been appointed are there for the right reasons. Second of all, there's the bonus that at the time of electoral change, although the ministers change and the policies change on the basis of what the electorate voted for, the people who delivered those policies don't change, and because they were appointed on the basis of merit, they can be trusted to deliver the policies of the people elected to decide on them. I think it's for any sovereign government to decide on its own system, but I think whatever the process is, it's really important that it's transparent and that people understand it. Because if people don't have faith in their civil servants, if people don't have faith in the people who are representing them overseas, then you have a real problem about representation and what it is that people get to vote for and how they see the government delivering for them. I think it's really important that a diplomatic service represents the country that it's from, because you're representing not just policy and trade overseas, but you're representing culture and values and I don't think you can do that if you only represent one part of society so my office the British uh, Foreign Service for a very long time was white male wealthy from the south of England and it's now going through a process of changing that and it takes time but it's really exciting for people to see that we are a very diverse country and we have uh, ambassadors who uh, take part in the pride parade in their country because they're two married men and being able to see that as Britain is just as important as being able to talk to us about our, what our policy is on Syria. It's really difficult how you change the representation and the diversity in an organisation because you don't just have to change your hiring practices you have to deal with the fact that there may be some societal elements that are impacting on that. Who's getting the access to education? Um, who even thinks of applying to your organisation? Uh, when I joined the Foreign Office, a number of people said to me, oh, I didn't know the Foreign British Foreign Office employed Jewish people. I have a Muslim friend who joined the office who was basically told exactly the same thing. Uh, our current uh, top civil servant, the permanent undersecretary, has just put up a, it's called a wall of firsts. So what it has is a picture of the first to do something, our first black ambassador, our first female ambassador to NATO. And for some of those jobs, it only has a mirror because we've never had a female ambassador in Washington. We've never had a female ambassador in Paris. We've never had a, the top female job in, top job in Brussels to be female. So what you have there now instead is a mirror. And the idea is that you look at it and you say, maybe it could be me. So it's about making yourself an organisation where actually people who don't see themselves at the top and don't necessarily believe that they could ever be the ambassador to Washington actually think, well, maybe, maybe this is an organisation that I can be in and can change. I think if you want to become a diplomat, I mean, there are some obvious things. Obviously, an interest in foreign countries, language skills are all useful. But I think there's something else which is about empathy. It's about being able to understand that you're working with people who are different from you. They come from different places than you. They maybe have different values to you. And you can gain experience in that, not just through traveling 
around the world, but actually in communities that you can volunteer in, in the place that you live, communities that are different from yours. And I think those skills are invaluable for a modern diplomat. So when I joined the Foreign Office, you had a training course along with the set of people who joined with you, where they taught you what ministers wanted in terms of paperwork, how we dealt with parliament, so the practical sort of paperwork bureaucrat elements. Uh, then we had courses on things such as negotiation. Uh, how do you negotiate? How do you negotiate bilaterally? How do you negotiate multilaterally? But since then, the Foreign Office has established something it calls the Diplomatic Academy, which does ongoing training at different levels. You can be a practitioner, you can be an expert, and it has it for different areas of diplomacy, from the economic to, as I mentioned before, the multilateral, plus different departments within the office run training. I worked for international organizations department, so we ran training on how to work in the UN, what it was like to be in the UN. Um, so we have quite a lot of ongoing formal training, then there are a lot of just generally workshops, you know, and talks and lectures uh, on different issues, ambassadors returning from places, the Middle East Department have a sort of weekly discussion, which you can phone in from around the world. Um, but the Diplomatic Academy also does things for anyone around the world and offers courses and training. Uh, so you don't just have to be a British diplomat to get access to that. One thing that I think it's useful to think about is what's the purpose of a diplomatic service? So it has so many different roles from promoting the trade for your country, whether that's Tikvesh wines um, or British James Bond films in our case, to representing the needs of citizens overseas, lost passports, voting, um, voting overseas and dealing with crises, dealing with emergencies, dealing with the impact of dead relatives. You know, it's such a range of skills and such a range of issues that a diplom a di your average diplomat can be dealing with that it's really great and that's a fantastic opportunity. But what is the training that you need for that whole range of skills and how do you ensure that as people move up in their careers, they're able to use, have the right skills to manage the people beneath them. So maybe the skills you need for dealing with a consular crisis in London are not the same skills you need for running a department here in Skopje. So how do you develop and train your staff as they go through the organization so you continue to strengthen the organization? And I think that's a real challenge, and I think it's a challenge for all diplomatic services.